Okay, I think I am on air. Good morning here in Palm Springs, California. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Today I want to talk about efficiency and intensity. And the reason the subject came up is that th this year is sort of like a, a 50 year anniversary year for me. In October, my wife and I will celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary. 50 years ago, in the spring of 1969, I uh, was preparing for my uh, British Foreign Service exam in Mandarin Chinese. And I remember thinking at the time, because I had managed to cover in 10 months what the other diplomatic language students in Hong Kong, whether they be from Japan, the US, Britain, wherever, they were Canada, they were taking two years. And yet I think, you know, I did better than they did. I spoke better, I understood better. And uh, I felt at that time that one of the reasons was the intensity of my approach to learning Chinese. Like I was going out at six, seven hours a day. I wanted to do it I was in that course. I wanted to do it in one year, not in two. And I felt that the sort of the white heat of my intensity, in fact, helped me learn it better than those who were doing it over a longer period of time. So I felt at that time that it's better to work doubly hard in a limited period of time to create the intensity that makes that acquisition period uh, more effective. I had no proof of that, but I felt that to be the case. So I was thinking about that and I was thinking about how the whole issue of intensity and efficiency and effectiveness, you know, uh, influences what I now do in language learning. So I thought I would uh, share some of my thoughts with you and get some feedback from you. Uh, and when I think of my language learning, like before I went to Hong Kong, the language that I had the say the first language that I could say that I really achieved fluency in was French. And I did that by leaving the classroom and totally sort of immersing myself, intensively immersing myself in French language content. Uh, movies, I remember La Nouvelle Vague, the new movies. At first I watched them, didn't understand what they were talking about, and eventually I did. I did a lot of reading. Uh, and of course in Montreal, like I was at McGill University for two years before I left. Uh, but I would go over to the University of Montreal and sit in, which is the French language university in Montreal, and listen in on lectures, not understand anything, but kind of, it was all part of my intensive immersion in French. And then as a result of all of that, uh, I went to France where I lived for three years and, and studied in French. So everything was happening in French. So it was a very intense French experience. Um, when I lived in France, I used to hitchhike into Spain. And so I would be six hours a day riding in a truck with a French truck, at least a Spanish truck driver, speaking at first in halting Spanish and eventually better and better because I, I went there many times. This was during Franco's time. And I can remember being in a truck with this truck driver for six hours and then he had to stop and he of course had a bed in his cab and I slept in the ditch and climbed back in the next morning and we continued on. And uh, I mean, Spain in those days was, was simply amazing. I remember once uh, coming into Barcelona, getting on a bus with my rucksack and the people helped me on with the rucksack and then they said, come on over to our local bar. And of course they poured out this, uh, their wine in this uh, glass thing that had a long spout and you've got to aim it right at your mouth or else you get it all over your shirt. So lots of different intense experiences uh, with Spanish. But uh, if I look at my language learning now, um, and the other thing that made me think about this um, intensity thing is, I suddenly noticed that Link, all of a sudden, the loading of the lessons has become much faster. So if I had a long 20 minute, 25 minute, lesson that I had brought in from a podcast and then of course the corresponding text, uh, it would take 20 seconds to load. And, and also I think the more content you have in a language, the longer these things take to load because the system has to, you know, compare your known words against what's in your database. I don't know what the system does, but it used to take time. They've now sped it up. It, it, my longest, um, you know, podcast from Al Jazeera, they're up in three, four seconds. So a small thing, but every little small thing affects the intensity and the efficiency of your learning.
learning experience. Uh, and you know, we see this in other things in life. For example, I don't know if many of you play golf, but in golf, if, uh, if your ball uh, sort of lands just in front of the green, so you have to chip onto the green where the hole is. And so you have either a pull cart or you're driving a cart. And if you leave that in front of the green, chip onto the green and putt out, you then have to walk back to where your cart is in order to move on to the next tee box. Whereas what you're supposed to do and what some people don't do, you're supposed to park your cart on that side of the green, which is in the direction of the next tee box so that you don't walk back, you walk to the side so that people behind you can hit their ball. And if on 18 holes, if you waste 30 seconds on each hole, that's nine minutes. That's nine minutes that the whole course is backed up because everybody is playing sort of right on the heels of the next person as you're going around a golf course. So it's just an example. You know, if everybody took 15 seconds less over every stroke or every putt, uh, again, it just speeds it up for everyone. And so every little thing, you know, I remember when I started learning Russian, like uh, Russian, I was two years before I started speaking. Whereas now with Farsi or Persian and Arabic, I'm speaking quite early. Uh, I attribute some of that to uh, the mini stories, which I think are very efficient. But also uh, I can remember learning Russian and going through these Russian texts and Link was so slow that it would take three, four seconds or longer for each word that I looked up, you know, to, to come up in our online dictionaries. And now they're instant. So all of these little things speed up the efficiency of the learning process. Uh, I remember when I was learning Chinese, for example, uh, I wouldn't use the standard dictionary because it's so inefficient. It's A, very inefficient to use a, Japanese, a Chinese dictionary because you have to go by stroke count uh, or by radical or by some other means. Or if you know how the word is pronounced and you have a Chinese dictionary which is organized alphabetically in sort of English, you might be able to find it more quickly, but it's quite time consuming to look up a word in a Chinese dictionary. And then as with any dictionary, the minute you close the dictionary, eight times out of 10, you've forgotten what the meaning was. So I would never do that. I would always, I would scour the bookstores in Hong Kong to find readers which had word lists behind every story. And the problem with word lists, of course, is that very often the word you're looking for isn't on the word list and the word list is full of a lot of words that you already know. So it's not ideal. But those words that I couldn't find a meaning for, I just left them. Didn't matter. So to that extent, again, the fact that with online dictionaries, you can click on a word and see it right away, see examples of it. Nowadays, you know, if you're learning a, a language where you have conjugations, which is not the case with Chinese, but then you can see the conjugations. There's some available at our fingertips. Um, all of this increases the efficiency of language learning. And every little bit of efficiency increases the intensity of the language experience. By the way, talking about intensity, when I do flashcards, it's language exposure to me. And therefore I put all of the information on the front of the flashcard. And I'll do this sometimes between pages in a lesson at link. And because I want a sort of concentrated, more intense exposure to some of the words and phrases that I didn't get and I still don't feel that I know in the, in the lesson. But I don't want to be scratching my brain. I don't, I don't believe it is efficient in terms of language learning to be trying to remember something. Uh, I'm also against any form of question about what, you know, was the meaning of this, that or the other, the sort of uh, comprehension questions that people give you where uh, you're forced to try to remember the story, but that's not the same as getting more intense exposure to the language. That's why, for example, in our mini stories, we, uh, you know, we have the uh, two sort of, uh, you know, uh, point of view column versions of the same story. And then we have the questions and in the questions, the answer is given to you. So you don't have to scratch your brain, which I consider to be a diversion from absorbing the language. It says, you know, Steve went to the store. Steve went to the grocery store. 
Did Steve go to the library? No, he didn't go to the library. He went to the grocery store. So the answer is given to you. I consider that creates more intensity. That's, for example, why I'm not a big fan of using movies or video as a learning tool. I think movies or video are great as a stimulus. It's fun. It's exciting. I can remember my excitement when I watched my first movies in Russian, and these were Soviet era movies. Uh, one was the first one I ever watched, which is one of my favorite movies of all times, was, uh, you know, the, the, it's based on a play called Bezbredanitsa, and it was Jestoki Ramats, a fabulous, exotic Russia on the Volga in the 19th century. I mean, I was just like, wow, I got to get at this. So it's tremendously stimulating. However, in any movie, it's less word intense than pure audio or pure reading. I remember my disappointment after listening to, you know, Sanguayeni, which is the romance of the three kingdoms, uh, told by a Chinese storyteller. And, and the Chinese uh, storytelling art, it's like phenomenal. You can almost smell the dust listening to the words and it's all coming from words. And then I watched a movie of Sanguayeni, and there's just a bunch of people flying around, sword fighting, and you know, horses challenge, charging around. And it's just not as intense a, a language experience. So uh, I believe that intensity, word intensity, audio word intensity, listening, reading, uh, making sure that you maximize the time that you spend with the language, and every little trick that uh, makes the language learning experience uh more intense that pays a lot of dividends and i remember thinking and i think i mentioned this in my book uh the way of the linguist i think it was called which i wrote yeah over 10 years ago that that the the benefits of intensity are are sort of geometrical in other words if if you learn it twice as fast you don't just learn it twice as well maybe you learn it three times as well so all of that, and, and that's why for the longest time I was against the idea of learning more than one language at one time. But here I am learning Arabic and Farsi or Persian. So what has changed? Well, I just think that the language learning environment has become so much more uh, efficient. Uh, and so, you know, I can get on LinkedIn, I can see 10 languages, I could jump into any one of them right now, bingo, and I could do many stories or novels or whatever I want. It's just become so much more convenient. Plus, maybe also, um, I'm sacrificing some intensity, no question, uh, because I'm curious to sort of dabble in both languages. So it's also a matter of what your, what your motives are. If I had a deadline, if I was being paid by my government, as was the case with Chinese 50 years ago, uh, to learn Arabic, then I would obviously spend all my time on Arabic and I would go at it, at it not an hour or, or two a day, but six or seven hours a day. And I'm convinced that I would learn that Arabic in six or seven months, uh, much as I did with, with Chinese. And I would learn it faster because the whole, whole language learning environment, P3, uh, MP3 technology, the resources on the internet, uh, all of that has become so much more efficient that I have no doubt that if I were to commit myself to full-time study of Arabic, it would be a matter of half a year before I could be, uh, you know, comfortably reading uh, newspapers, conversing, and so forth and so on. So that's kind of the main theme today. And uh, before going on, I am going to have a quick look at, uh, at any questions that might have been uh, presented to me or comments. So let me just go here at the beginning. Boom, 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 boom. All right. Good morning. Uh, hi, Steve. Dueling language teachers in Tennessee, I believe. Hi, Steve. Uh, Eric, I have a few questions from Marcus. Blah, blah, blah. Mentions already started. So, would you say it is more effective to study four hours a day for 25 days or one hour a day for 100 days? No question four hours a day for 25 days, I believe, and I have no scientific uh, you know, proof of that. Now, it may very well be that 
there is a sort of gestation period. I've often felt this, that even after I learn something, it takes a while for the brain to sort of absorb it. So is 25 days just simply too short a period of time? It's possible. I have noticed that if I study something and leave it and I come back to it later, it's actually, I've got a better grasp on it. So it may very well be that four hours a day for 25 days is not enough. That there, it, there may be a critical period, like three months that you need. And it will also depend on which languages you know and what the languages you're learning and stuff like that. But as a general rule, without sort of specifically addressing this four hours a day for 25 days versus one hour a day for 100 days, and even assuming, like, how do you really control for that? Like, when I say I study an hour a day, some days I study two hours, some days I study 40 minutes, half an hour, not at all. Too difficult to say specifically, but as a general rule, at least in my experience, six months of intensive study is better than two years of not intensive study. Recommend the focus. I mean, it's the same. What do you recommend to uh, focus on uh, to, to achieve a B1? A B1 is actually not a very high level. And if you do a lot of listening and reading, I uh, actually think that our many stories take you to B1. And uh, that's, in fact, if I, okay, here's a language, X, Turkish, you have to get to B1, I would do the many stories. I would totally focus on the many stories. I would listen to them many times. And one thing, by the way, when I say listen to the many stories 30, 40 times, I'm not saying that you take the first mini story and listen to it 30 times. I listen to lesson one, once or twice. It's all fo foggy, fuzzy. I listen to lesson two, foggy, fuzzy, lesson three. Then maybe I go back to lesson one, two, three, four, back to one, two, three, four, five. And so I keep on progressing. Because we do have to have, you know, I became, you know, I want to get to a new story because I'm tired of this one story. The brain cannot, you cannot listen to the same story. I can't over and over and over again. Uh, you have to go forward and come back, go forward and come back. That keeps it a little fresher. And then you're happy to rediscover a story that you listened to before, didn't understand hardly anything. And now you understand more. Uh, so, yeah, I would focus on the many stories. Hello from Polish viewer. Cheers. <laughs> hey Steve, hello from Hungary. Boy, one day, maybe. Hungarian. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Excuse me, I have a question. If you are going to read two articles, one is a lot of new words, another one is only a few new words, which one will help you most for learning the language? Uh, you know, theoretically, the more new words, the more new words potentially you can acquire. But if the, if the uh, text is full, sort of has too many new words, then it's too tough. You're not enjoying it. There's no sort of fluency. There's no sense of flow. You know that there's a famous uh, Hungarian, I think he was, uh, thinker who talked about the sense of flow. The sense of flow, and his, na his name was Cisces Mihaili, difficult to pronounce. It, 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 to him, flow was when you had a task that was difficult, yet you felt you could overcome the obstacles, you could achieve success. So if you're in a situation where it's too easy, there's no sense of flow. But if you have a sense that you're struggling with a task that is difficult, but you're confident that you can achieve your goal, that is flow. That's the ideal situation to be in. So if you have, I think for me personally, if I have texts that are 10% new words, that's good. 20% new words is getting tough. 5% new words is too few. So you have to find that sort of sweet spot where it's a challenge, but you don't find it too difficult. So I would say, uh, you know, you, you, the question is a little bit vague here. Uh, percentage, which is something we measure at link, I think 10%, 15% new words, somewhere between five and 15 is, is what I would go for. Uh, Steve, I'm learning French. You talk about the value in listening. While I listen only and not read along, I can only understand the odd word. Can, what is that? Is this still a value? Well, you, you know, we all struggle with this. We can obviously we can read better than we can understand when we listen, uh, because when we read, we can look words up. We have the time. We didn't quite get it the first time. We read the sentence again. It makes sense. Plus, we know the words when we see them. We may not uh, recognize the words when we hear them. So. Here, it's simply a matter of giving the chance, giving the brain a chance to get used to it. 
The brain learns. I say this all the time. I quote Manfred Spitzer. The brain can only, cannot do otherwise than learn. The brain is a learning machine, but the brain learns slowly. So you have to feed the brain all the time, lots of exposure. And in the case of this comprehension thing, go back and read again, review the words and phrases, listen again, go back again, and gradually uh, you'll understand more and more. And also, don't forget what I said about don't, don't overdo the repetition. Like if I'm doing a mini story, I'm not gonna listen to one mini story 10 times right there. My brain will say, no thanks. The brain does require some novelty, some refreshment. So I go one, two, three, four, five, six, back to one and so forth and so on, up to 10, back to one. So that in time you understand more. The brain will get used to hearing the sounds. Uh, okay. Now, hi, Steve. What do you think about complete immersion in the target language, for example, go to the country and study, doing, reading, many stories, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Obviously, you know, if you're in the country where the language is spoken, you have lots of potential exposure to the language. So that's kind of ideal. But a couple of things on that. I learned Mandarin Chinese in Hong Kong where no one spoke Mandarin, just about no one. So it, you don't have to go to the country to learn the language. Uh, in Japan, I lived surrounded by the language, which is an advantage. I could go to the store, buy something, say a few things in Japanese and feel good about myself because I was able to do something in Japanese. So it is an advantage. Um, but I was not sent, I didn't go to Japan to learn Chinese. My government sent me to Japan to work at the Canadian Embassy. I was there anyway, I'm going to take advantage of it. If your goal is to go to the language, to work, to go to the country to work on your language, prepare yourself first. In other words, get yourself to a level where you can actually do something in the language. Because if you arrive with nothing, then you're going to spend the first few months doing what you could have done at home, intensive listening and reading. And so that then when you get to the country, all of a sudden you look around, you read, you understand the signs, you can read the newspaper, you can uh, order something, go to a store. In other words, you hit the ground running. And that's my sort of best practices. If it is your goal, and, and it's, it's really good to have as a goal, I want to go to the country. So that's the motivation. And then work very hard at home to get yourself to a B1 level, let's say, and then go to the country and then you will do very well. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Okay, my plan is to start speaking Japanese at two years. I should have a six to 8,000 vocabulary that speaking early results in a bad accent. I don't think speaking early results in a bad accent or anything else uh, because you, most of the sort of influence on your accent is going to be what you listen to. And you will listen to massive amounts of native speaker, hopefully, say Japanese. And that's what's going to, if you're open to it and flexible and willing to take a chance with trying to pronounce things and you start to hear the language better, all of that is going to matter the most. Uh, yeah, you're going to pronounce very poorly at the beginning. Uh, it doesn't matter when you start, you're going to pronounce poorly. Uh, if you have done a lot of listening, you'll probably pronounce better at the beginning. But if you have a few inter interactions in the language at an early stage, I don't think that has any negative uh, effect on you. As long as you remain open, as long as you continue to notice what's happening in the language. Uh, my position is speaking early or late depends on your opportunity, depends on your inclination. I don't think it has a particularly positive or negative effect on your learning. The bulk of your learning is input activity. Uh, okay, see, I had trouble importing a news article with the extension today. Okay, uh, this is Swedish Finn Frankofall. Frankofall, uh, please report any of this on the forum, maybe other people. Oh, here again, another one. A link extension has stopped working for me. I tried a different browser, but no luck. So we have two people reporting this. I will uh, report this. And of course, it's always good to report this on the forum because there are things that happen. And if other people are having, sometimes we never know if it's an individual uh, problem relating to some setup of theirs or if it's more common problem. So this looks like it might be a more common problem. But again, if you don't mind reporting it on the forum, in any case, I will report it to the office uh, after this session. Uh, it's hard to read. An article has a lot of new words. Yeah, that's true. You don't believe that being forced to recall words occasionally helps forge the neural pathway in the brain for when you begin output? No, I don't. 
uh, I find that sort of uh, when I listen to the mini stories and I hear certain words and phrases over and over again, that forges uh, new neural pathways. Path pathways. Uh, I'm not convinced that trying to recollect a word is forging a new pathway uh, because I feel language is, is more of a habit. We're developing new habits. We're developing new habits. It's not acquiring new knowledge. We're, we're forging new sort of language habits. But, but I'm sure there's research out there that proves me wrong. But that's my impression. Okay. Steve is anti-SRS. I have no idea why. Yeah, I am anti-SRS. I'm not anti-SRS. I don't use SRS very much. Lots of people do. Lots of people love it. That's fine. People should do what they like to do. I feel that I have a limited amount of time to spend with the language. I prefer to spend it listening and reading, overwhelmingly listening. Now, if there were some SRS listening that I could do where on some basis the words that I should be learning all showed up in an audio file that I could take with me, I would listen to that. But to actually sit down and go through flashcards when I have thousands of unknown words would simply be too time consuming. It's not where I want to spend my time. Uh, if anyone has an idea on how to create audio files, natural voice of the words that you're that are high in your SRS spaced repetition system list, that's something I might be interested in. Words have phrases, but it's entirely up to what people like to do. Uh, SRS literature is yours, you know, and remember what you think you do. No, it's that's not true. You can learn something and then it's forgotten again. And, and if it shows up six months later uh, and you, you, uh, you know, see it in your SRS deck and review it, maybe that helps to trigger the recollection. But the same thing would happen if you were reading context and came across it. Uh, I'm not convinced that, that uh, you, you know, there's so many emotional and other things that affect why you remember certain words. Uh, maybe you're asked for a word, you get it wrong for whatever reason. Maybe you knew that word. You did, didn't. You know, you were under some stress and stuff. I, I just don't buy it. But people who enjoy whatever you enjoy doing, go for it. Uh, also in Vancouver, John was wondering if I can ever hope to see you at one of the local. I'd love to, you know, uh, send me a note, steve at link.com. Uh, I'm in Palm Springs right now, but uh, I'll be back in uh, mid April. Send me a note. I'd be glad to come out. Uh, okay, I need an English native speaker. You can sign up with a tutor uh, somewhere. Uh, reading is more important than English. No, no. Link needs Hindi. If people will come up with Hindi content, we'll put them up there. Somebody gave us the 60 mini stories in Gujarati, and we have Gujarati. If someone gives us Hindi, we'll put it up. Uh, how to learn Chinese intonation. Cheers from Alarusa. Um, you know, intonation. When I, I, I think it's, it's a lot of listening. It's focusing on phrasing uh, because it's very difficult to remember the individual tone of each individual word. But if you get used to saying certain phrases and if you've heard these phrases, as in the mini stories, for example, and you hear them and hear them and hear them, then they start to become natural. And so you come out with natural phrasing using the tones. And I've said before that I did a lot of listening to Xiangsheng. Xiangsheng are Chinese sort of comedians, two comedians talking to each other. And of course, their whole intonation is very much exaggerated. And so you're exposed to this exaggerated intonation. And I found that helpful to give me a bit of a the rhythm of the of the tones. Uh, OK. What is the language you know best other than English? French. I don't use mnemonic link words no i've never been willing to invest in that some people use that as a strategy i don't as, as you know i'm basically listening and reading and eventually speaking learning spanish i can say that i understand quite well slow spoken spanish but i feel like i can't keep up with normal tv shows sure uh i lived in japan for nine years it took me a long time to understand japanese tv shows even though i was doing business in japanese so it's difficult to understand tv shows you're not in that you know, context. So you're kind of a bystander and it's, it's more difficult. And the only way you get there is to do more and more listening. Uh, okay. Okay. So Steve, 
Sensei Indo Kara Konnichiwa. Uh, hello from India in Japanese. Okay. Mihali Chik Sent Mihali. Uh, yeah, he is great. Okay. Uh, hi, Steve. This is my first text in English since ever. I would like to know how many hours a student should have to be to be considered an advanced listener. I don't know the answer to that question, but uh, you know, if you listen an hour a day, that's 365 hours a year. Uh, I think a thousand, like I remember when I lived in Japan, they had a challenge, a thousand hours of listening. I think that's a good goal, a thousand hours of listening. Uh, coupled with reading, of course, you don't want to just listen to things that you don't understand. Steve, when are you going to learn Dutch? Um, yeah, I mean, I'd like to. Right now, I'm sort of motivated to learn, you know, Persian, Arabic, Turkish, you know, the whole Central Asia, Middle East area. But I've had a look at Dutch at length, and uh, I feel it wouldn't be very difficult. I mean, the grammar, I don't know what, what hidden shoals there are there, but uh, certainly in terms of vocabulary, it doesn't look that difficult. Uh, I might. It's not high on my list right now. Uh, I used to listen to podcasts more, but uh, he talked about uh, your team in a language many times. So I started listening to yours, and it really makes me like you. Really, you know, well, <clears throat> you know, languages. AJ Ho is a great guy. Like he's very enthusiastic. I think enthusiasm is extremely important because language learning is a fun thing to do. It should be fun, and you need a high degree of motivation and enthusiasm to to stay with it because. At times, it looks like we're not making much progress and we have to stay with it because eventually we do make progress and we sort of sometimes we have excessive expectations of what we can achieve in the short run and we don't realize just how much we achieve in the long run. Hi, Steve. How do I go from good to great in reading Japanese? But when I'm reading a novel, I have to look up a lot of words in the dictionary. Oh, this is from Sairam Subaramani. Yeah, uh, novels are hard. There's no question. Novels is the most are the most difficult things. Uh, Nonfiction, newspapers, history, translations, all of these things are easier. When we get into novels, this is creative literature in the language. We're going to be dealing with more difficult vocabulary, rarer, low frequency vocabulary. I mean, what I do is I import these things into Link. I get the e-text version, I bring it into Link, and then that just becomes part of my learning. Uh, if I'm going to read a novel in German, even a language that I'm fairly good at, like German, I would bring it into Link. Russian the same way, just learn those words because there's going to be a lot of unknown words in literature. Uh, okay. Uh, will you guys ever make Link shirts? We should. Thank you. I will get on the office. Okay. How, hey man, how are you? I'm fine. Jayo, okay. When you go to a foreign country, how do you create opportunities for yourself to speak other than the taxi rides and ordering beer? Yeah, uh, so here's some examples. I spent a year learning Czech, um, mostly listening and reading on my own. And then I had some online tutors. So I arranged to spend seven hours a day speaking Czech, six hours. So I had two online tutors, so that's an hour each. And I think I knew some people that I spoke to. And then I happened to be at lunch and I struck up a conversation with uh, some people sitting beside me. It's difficult. When I was in uh, Latin America, uh, Argentina, Brazil, and uh, Peru, I would say most of my conversations were with taxi drivers. Um, which is a good deal down there because the taxi drivers aren't that expensive. So it's, it's, it's a good deal. Uh, similarly, when I was in Morocco, most of my conversations in standard Arabic were with taxi drivers. Not all taxi drivers spoke standard Arabic. It is difficult. Uh, um, yeah, you can go into a store, you have a brief interaction, but it's very limited. It is it's kind of good though, because even if you're fairly good in the language, if you go in, in a given situation, you know, you go into a store, you go, in, you know, you're whatever, uh, at the train station, uh, you don't really know what they're going to throw at you. Like you have the words, but you're not used to doing that. So the first time you do it, it's a bit clumsy um, because they don't 
you know, I had the same experience in Ukraine. They don't consider themselves language teachers. You're just another person buying a ticket. So they're going to go at you. And you kind of have to think through, like, what did she actually say? Then the second time you go there, now you're ready for it, right? So it is kind of fun to do those things, to have these short interactions in the language, but extensive exchanges, conversations, unless you know people, is kind of difficult. Uh, yeah, that's all I can say. Uh, okay, would you be interested in learning a fictional language? Uh, where are you going? Okay, fictional language like Klingon, not in the slightest. Uh, I like to learn languages that are spoken by people in a country where I can get into the history, the culture of the language, possibly run into people who speak those languages sitting beside me. Like when I was flying from Iguazu, Brazil to, to Rio, and the gentleman sitting beside me was a Paraguayan of uh, Ukrainian origin, and we spoke a little Spanish, and then we spoke Ukrainian. That's fun. I don't expect to sit beside someone who speaks Klingon. Uh, okay, I can read real Spanish when I try to speak. My verb tenses get confused. Of course, verb tenses are tough. Uh, it's like the case endings in Slavic languages. It's something we're not used to if we're English speakers. And it takes a long time to get used to. It's easy to understand the principle. Yeah, I mean, even in English, uh, how many non-native speakers still can't get the fact that the third person singular of the present tense takes, takes, present tense takes an S? Uh, you know, uh, whatever, uh, he, he go, he go, or the, the, you get that all the time. It's difficult to force new habits. What I do with conjugation and, and is, for example, in Spanish, there's a number of conjugations that give me trouble and you don't want to be thinking about them. So say, if I'm at link, I save a word, I use context reversal or conjugate or one of those conjugating dictionaries. I then go and quickly review the conjugation for that verb and leave it. I can't remember it, but it's just, it just reminds me, reminds me. You just keep on doing that, keep on doing that, keep on hearing it, keep on reminding yourself of where that fits in and slowly the brain develops new habits. And it's like with cases in Slavic languages, with tones in Chinese you, or with, with gender, you know, you're gonna gradually improve your, your uh, accuracy. You're gonna go from 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 and you'll never be perfect. And you, that, but, but you just gotta keep on doing it. Чем разница между американским, британским и английским? Yeah, what's the difference between British and American English? All right, first of all, within North American English, because I throw Canadian in there, uh, and sort of British English, there are regional variations. So overwhelmingly, the difference is pronunciation. But there are some words that are used that, that uh, and, uh, say a North American would understand, unless it's slang, would understand in say British English, but wouldn't necessarily use and vice versa. So there's some minor differences of vocabulary. The biggest difference is in pronunciation. Uh, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, let's see. In my uh, inspiration, thank you, I'm glad. In my opinion, Japanese pronunciation is the easiest in the world. Which have been the most useful language you've learned so far that gave you the most satisfaction? Well, satisfaction, they all give me satisfaction. I mean, this evening we have a birthday party for my wife and we've invited people here in the neighborhood, including a couple from who are originally from Iran, been living in the States for 30 plus years. I am hoping to speak to them in Persian. That gives me immense satisfaction. Uh, you know, it gives me satisfaction to be able to understand if I see Koreans, Chinese, Russians, French, Brazilians, I can understand them. That, that nothing seems that foreign to me. Uh, and hopefully soon that'll be the case with Arabic and Persian as well. Uh, obviously in terms of, from a business perspective, the most useful language has been Japanese. Because I lived there for nine years, I did business in Japanese. I built up my lumber business based on doing business in Japan. So I would say Japanese has been the most useful professionally but in terms of satisfaction, they all give me satisfaction. Uh, okay, I love your, do you, wait a second. Do you putting a point for you? I don't understand. I love your videos that are learning English for a while and I've become good enough to watch movies without subs and I have a decent accent. How can I take you to the next level? To take, okay, if you love your learning, if you just keep on doing it, reading, read novels, watch movies, talk to people, 
All of that is continuing to improve as long as you're still curious about the language. Now we have immigrants who say come to Canada, they're not curious about the language, they're not interested in learning and they don't improve. But if you're motivated to improve and you're eager to learn new words and you're exposing yourself to the language and you're speaking when you can without worrying about it, you will improve. It will take you to the next level in due course. Don't be anxious. Um, okay, what is your opinion on the AJATT method? I can't comment because I don't know enough about it. And I, you know, I don't want to comment based on a superficial understanding. How much should I understand what I'm reading or listening to in order for it to count as comprehensible input? Do I need a vivid image in my mind of what is being described? Uh, no, uh, I feel that uh, as I'm listening to stuff, I mean, take Persian. I mean, I started from scratch with the mini stories. It was just noise, didn't understand a thing. And we don't have good dictionaries for Persian. Like there are no good online dictionaries for Persian. Uh, and we don't have text to speech, which I found very useful for Arabic. So well, there were a lot of things going against me. And I would listen and not understand more than 20, 30 percent, but it's all good. It's all gradual. And then you reread and then you listen and you slowly improve. So comprehensible input to me means that maybe, you know, you have at least the possibility of getting to where you understand it. So you have to have a transcript and it shouldn't be too difficult for you. But initially, it's going to be very difficult because you know nothing. And so you gradually, gradually get to where you understand more and more. I tend to move on to new material, even though I only understand 70% of what I was listening to. And this is this whole thing between repetition and novelty. So you can't keep on listening to the same stuff over and over again. The brain starts to get less and less interested. Uh, so you kind of have to vary it. But I think uh, I don't see any hard and fast rule that it has to have X percent, you know, comprehensible content for the thing to be considered comprehensible input. Uh, OK, I am. All right. Uh, how much? OK, I'm afraid you make mistakes we cannot use while I think you should to use at the moment. Can you ask Steve about it? You make mistakes we cannot use. I don't understand the question. Uh, I, uh, I'm an intermediate, but I can, I can just read your book that, by the way, is incredible. Can you say that I now know more than 5,000 words? If you read my book, you probably know more than 5,000 words. Bitcoin is simple, says you skipped my question. Well, I can't go back. There's a long list here. If you ask the question again, if I come across it, I will answer it. Uh, how to improve listening effectively. I've been learning for a long time. My listening is still... It, it, like so much in language, you just got to keep doing it. But combine the listening with reading. I don't memorize. Okay. Okay, but to answer, you shouldn't because you... Yes, a uh, question here about uh, uh, SRS. I did use a sort of a modified SRS version to learn the first thousand characters in Chinese. Okay, I have the same level, how to change it. I'm fed up with it, I live in art. I mean, one of the things is get a novel. Get a novel for which you can find the audiobook. Um, I mean, if, I, if you're a member of Link, import the novel, buy it, take the digital version, import it into Link. Uh, I have found a novel, once you have actually conquered a novel, read it, listened to it, that really elevates your, your level of confidence in the language, it really gets you into the language. And once you've done one, you can do another. So that's one thing I would recommend. Okay, Link Socks. Huh. Soy inglés, pero hablo español, italiano, francés, alemán. De poco empecé a aprender portugués. Un saludo. Okay. Good idea. I would love some link socks. Uh, da, da, da. You mean combine and... I don't... Should I do when I read a novel right now? I am reading Harm on Rye. Well, my approach to learning a novel is that I bring it into link so I can save all the words. Kif... Now, my Arabic reading is not... Kif ata al... Alamat Alajaria. Steve's safe. 
I don't know. I, I, I'm working on Arabic. It's a work in progress. Yeah, language learning is a social activity. I agree. And interacting with books and content, listening and reading is also a social activity. Uh, did you ever think you would reached 150,000? No, I had no idea what I was going to do. You know, uh, I, w I am going to get back to these Arabic texts, but uh, uh, too tough for me. Great Germany do it called Sandwich Man. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, according to the US Foreign Institute, it takes more hours for the diplomat to learn Japanese than any other language, including Japanese. Why do you think this is? I have no idea. I don't think Japanese is that difficult. Uh, but then I had the Chinese characters ahead of time. Uh, I didn't find Japanese particularly difficult. Uh, how do you get good at Chinese? No different. You got to learn the characters and you do a lot of listening and reading. I will be Chris here. Yeah, at this point, you know, I'm thinking of going to Fukuoka to the Polyglot Conference and, of course, to the Longfest in Montreal. And so I just can't be going to everyone, so I'm going to skip uh, Bratislava. Exciting time to be alive, isn't it? Yes. You know, when I hear so much negativity about the world today, there are real problems. There are real problems in, in the, you know, uh, as an example, I played golf here with a gentleman who had, been, who had worked for 44 years in a sawmill in British Columbia. And he's got, he's hol he holidays here in Palm Springs. He was a worker for 44 years and he has a pension. And he's able to holiday in Palm Springs. Those kinds of opportunities are fewer today. Somebody with limited education who have a good, well-paying job and end up with a good pension and has a house and so forth. So those are problems. We have to address those problems. There are problems of inequity. There are problems that a very small number of people seem to be making, you know, getting all of the wealth in society. And so these are issues that have to be addressed. There are issues with climate. But we have a degree of connectivity with the world. Like I'm talking to people all over the world right now. Um, we have means to solve these problems. If we apply ourselves to these real problems, it's an exciting time to be alive. Absolutely. I agree with that. I like to get optimistic comments from people. Uh, do you have some language that you would like to neglect? For example, you don't like it or are afraid to learn it because you think it is too hard. I hope that. <laughs> okay. I mean, I, I have struggled. I've struggled with Korean. Uh, I'm struggling now with Arabic and Persian, but it never discourages me. It's just that some languages are more difficult than others. Uh, the writing system is always a problem. Now, I invested a lot of time and effort into uh, Chinese characters. I can read Chinese characters more easily than I can read uh, Hangul or even Katakana. Uh, and it's just a function of how much reading I have done in, in Hanji, in Kanji. So, uh, but it doesn't discourage me and I want to get back to my Korean. It, it bothers me every time I meet Korean people and I'm not able to speak as well as I would like. I say, I've got to get back there and improve it. And yet now I'm working on Persian Arabic. There's only so many hours I can devote to language learning, but none that I would want to neglect. Why are English speaking Canadians terrible at French, but French speaking Canadians speak English relatively well, relatively better? Well, there are, I think, several reasons. First of all, North America is 360 million people uh, out of which barely six or seven million speak French. So that English is dominant in North America. So the motivation for a French Canadian to learn English is far greater than the motivation for an English Canadian to learn French. And, I, and the next thing is, of course, that as in Europe, the media, television, movies is dominated by English so that the exposure to English is far greater. That's why in countries like Sweden, for example, uh, young children speak English very well because they watch English TV. It's not because the S Swedish school system is better at teaching English than say, you know, the French school system. So uh, those are, and, and I also, I mean, I, I don't imagine that the uh, instruction in English in French schools in Canada is better than the instruction in French in English schools. So it's purely the environment, motivation, being surrounded by the language. On the other hand, my grandchildren speak French because they went to French immersion. Uh, 
So there are hundreds and hundreds of thousands of English Canadian kids who go to French immersion. So their French is okay. Those that go to the standard English Canadian school, a smaller number actually end up speaking the language. Um, that despite the fact that the government, Canadian government spends, I don't know, six, seven hundred million dollars a year to, mo to promote bilingualism outside Quebec and actually bilingualism outside Quebec is declining. I, I suggest instead of spending hundreds of millions of dollars, they should put everyone on link. Well, okay, okay, here's my question here. Is it okay to study a third language using your second one or is it better to use only your native language? If the second language is strong, then I think it's probably a good idea. It's more a function of what language learning material you can find, resources. And if they're available in a third, second language, by, by all means, go for it. Do you have any specific recommendations for beginners listening material for Japanese? Again, I am a fan of Link and I not studying Japanese right now, so I cannot re recommend anything other than Link. Maybe other people can. When I'm reading Chinese, I feel I rely too much on characters. I'm Japanese. Should I still read? Okay, it's good. I mean, for the longest time, I read Japanese, and every time I came across a Chinese character, I would pronounce it Chinese in my mind, because that's the pronunciation I was comfortable with. And it took me a long time to realize that that, that character was, in fact, this Japanese word that I heard so often, but I didn't necessarily connect the two. I think that's, uh, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's normal. But if you uh, do a lot of listening and reading and you see the text and you, it, you have a big advantage that you know the meaning. And if you're listening to it and you're reading it, gradually you'll start to identify the, those characters with the Chinese pronunciation. I would also use pinyin. If you're on link, you can get the pinyin to show up. And so that you gradually start to drive that pinyin pronunciation, pronunciation into your brain. It's a matter of time. When you listen to you listen to multiple small recordings and repeat how long I present. No, I tend to listen to the lesson. So uh, I will, now I do a lot of listening on our playlist at Link, so I'll just continue going through it. Sometimes if I want to hear the lesson more than once, I'll listen to it in the lesson, in which case it'll repeat. But most often I listen on the playlist, so I just listen, I just listen once and it goes to the next. And the unit is the lesson. So it could be one minute long, it could be three minutes, five minutes. Uh, over here. Stop learning grammar. Blah, blah, blah. Okay, I don't understand this language. Uh, I can't speak Hindi, but maybe one day. Am I going to be in Russia? You know what? I'd love to. Uh, I, I know I, I am going to be in, in Ukraine, mostly Eastern Ukraine and Kiev, where they're Russian speakers. Uh, I'd love to go back to Russia. All I saw was St. Petersburg and Moscow, and I would want to get into, you know, you know, Yaroslav or any of these places. Uh, I am fascinated by Russian culture, absolutely no question, and I will be back into Hindi. Yeah, okay, definitely I have to give it start. You know, so bother you when you meet people whose native language is one you don't know. Are there many Southeast Asian? No, it, it, I mean, yeah, I would love to speak the language of people I come across, but I have to be realistic. I cannot learn 10 languages at once, so it doesn't bother me if I find, uh, you know, if I come across Punjabi speakers, which it would be the most common South Asian people in Vancouver. Um, yeah, if I get in a cab with a Punjabi uh, driver and I, you know, and we chat, you know, that the numbers in Punjabi are very similar to numbers in Persian and stuff like that. And I'd love to learn the language, but I have to be realistic. Uh, what do you think about Kato Lam and her method of reading as soon as possible in a foreign language without a dictionary? Yeah. So Kato Lam lived in, uh, you know, 100 years ago or whenever. Uh, her basic thing is, reading okay when Catalan lived we didn't have mp3 players we didn't have the mountain of content available on the internet we didn't have online dictionaries uh so i'd be interested in knowing what her advice would be today uh, i am not a fan of reading without a dictionary i'm also not a fan of uh, monolingual dictionaries uh i believe they're inefficient I thought this discussion today was supposed to be about it, you know, intensity. Like, I want right away now, the, that word, what is kind of roughly the meaning. It may be not exactly what fits this context, but it gets me started in, in learning the word. And if I, am, you know, have no idea what the word is, or I have to use a monolingual uh, dictionary, which explains the word in the language, then it's full of more words that I don't know. Not for me. 
Uh, okay. Uh, so, yeah, who is Lam? She is a very famous Hungarian polyglot and has written a book. And who has a wonderful formula for language learning? La if I'm remembering now by, by memory, language learning is motivation and time divided by inhibition, frustration, other resistance factors. I agree with her. I'm reading the book Thief by Ramana. I love it. Uh, I did more for pleasure. I found a lot of new words. Should I look them up on the dictionary or should I guess the meaning? Well, I tend, if I'm good enough to read the book to enjoy it, then I don't bother looking up words. I mean, it's not like those words are going to run away. Eventually they'll show up again and again in other contexts and you'll eventually get a sense of what the word means. I find, again, looking words up in the dictionary is a low effectiveness, low intensity activity. Is it possible to talk to native speakers on Link? Yes, it is. Uh, just look up the tutors. Or you can contact someone in our community and set up your own exchange if you want. Can we report anything you want to link? Jumping back now that I can speak. You can import anything you want for your own use. Okay. In fact, we even have a total, you know, book import function. However, if you want to share anything in our library, you can only share material for which you have the copyright. In other words, either you created it or it's free of copyright or you've contacted the owner of the copyright but for your own use you can import whatever you want have you been to germany <laughs> absolutely uh wait a second that, out of order here i reached good level of fluency in english and link but after that i felt that i need more interviews to go to the next level like native consider what do you recommend well you know at some point we want to talk we want to talk a lot like the link is more to get you to a potential level in the language so now you have to engage with people and so the ideal thing, if you have the opportunity to go to some place where there's a lot of English spoken or engage with people online, that's kind of what you have to do. Uh, I'm from South of Germany. I have had, I, in the 90s, I did a lot of business in Germany. I used to travel. Ich habe Geschäft gemacht in Deutschland. Ich habe sehr gern. I was up and down on the Autobahn with my agent. We were speaking German for hours. And I find Germans are very friendly. Uh, the little towns are beautiful, even the big cities are very modern, nice restaurants, and they all have an old quarter. Germany is great, and I've been there many times. Are you planning on learning Turkish? Yes. I have read a lot of books in Cantonese, and I'm going to start learning Mandarin soon. How do I get used to reading in Mandarin when all the Cantonese pronunciation comes flying into my head? Um, you know, I had the reverse. I had to go from Mandarin to Cantonese. Just get a lot of text and let the new pronunciation flood into your brain. That's, I think, again, Link would be very good for that because you, you can be streaming the audio and you can even have the pinyin because you have the option of having the pinyin show up above the characters and you, you understand the characters, you have a big advantage. And then you just have to totally, and then you go away and listen to it and you go back and read and eventually and slowly you will set up another channel, another control center in your brain to handle Mandarin. That was my experience with Cantonese. Uh, one of the most useful languages business-wise, that depends entirely on your business, where you are. I mean, uh, they're all important somewhere. Um, I, can't, I can't answer that. Uh, English, I think, as a general statement, would be the most useful. I have read an article recently saying that learning new languages is useless since English is already dominating and translating apps, translation apps are developing. What is your take on that? I love learning languages. I love learning about the country, reading their history, hearing audiobooks in, about their history in their language. No language app is going to take that away. So if anything, I tend to believe that, that English, of course, is an extremely useful international language of exchange. Uh, if a Japanese person meets a Brazilian person, they can immediately communicate because they have English. It's not Esperanto. It's not, you know, Klingon. It's English. So that's very useful, but that's not what language learning is about. Language learning is about developing an, an, uh, an inroad into a different culture. And then when you encounter someone of that culture, you can speak to them in their language or they can speak to you in your language. They're you know, deriving the benefit. That's what language learning is all about. And language learning is easier now than it was 50 years ago when I started. Okay, so I think people are gonna learn languages faster and they're going to use things like uh, automatic translation and uh, text to speech and automatic dictation and all of these things are going to be tools enabling people to learn languages faster and faster as i am finding 
that I learn languages faster today than I ever did. I am learning the last three languages, Greek, Persian, and Arabic, I'm moving along faster than I did 10 years ago, not to mention 50 years ago with Chinese. Uh, where do you come from? Steve, how do you handle content that you have transcripts for, but not a translation? Uh, yeah, I mean, at length, most of our content has transcripts, not necessarily a translation. I, I don't really use the translations very much. I have an online dictionary. I can access several. If it's a language that where, you know, conjugation is an issue, I can even uh, access a conjugation dictionary. If I'm learning, uh, you know, Korean, I can go find a Chinese character that no longer shows up in Korean, but in fact is there and it helps me learn. And I prefer to, to uh, you know, attack our texts, both in terms of listening and then eventually in, in, in reading and, and learning, sort of mining these texts for words and phrases and information that's going to help these words and phrases stick with me. I'm not so interested in the translation because the translation kind of takes me away from that language context that I want to be in. So it, it, to me, it doesn't matter. Uh, okay, do you sometimes deliver think in a foreign language or talk to yourself in the next time? Occasionally, if I'm spending the whole day in Japanese or French, possibly Chinese, maybe Spanish, I might be talking to myself in that language, but it doesn't happen that often. Uh, you, sh you should do book, how will you be reading not understand? I'm studying English many years, I feel I cannot reach fluency, okay. I mean, you just got to keep going and be grateful for what you have achieved. A lot of people, they beat themselves up and criticize themselves for not being better than what they are, but they forget that sometime earlier, they couldn't do a thing in that language. So you go, we, we constantly learn, but we learn slowly. From Japan, total great. Uh, what is your goal by end of the 90 days? Okay, I mean, my goal is to know more than when I started. That's all and feel more comfortable and, and more confident that I can get better. Uh, and that's it. I don't necessarily, I'm not going to take a test. Uh, and I will at some point do a, maybe a conversation in both Arabic and Persian and people can make their own uh, assessment of, uh, you know, where we stand. Advice for listening comprehension in Italian. Yeah, first of all, link. And then and there's lots of good uh, podcasts. Rai has this, uh, Rai Due, Aleotto della Sera is a wonderful series. Get yourself a lot of interesting content, stuff you're interested in, audiobooks, uh, Il Narratore, which is a website. They have audio ebooks. They have the audio and the ebook. Uh, get those. Uh, you can listen to literature and you can import the ebook into Link. So, yeah, that's what I would recommend. Do you know Vera Berkman? What do you think of her? Cons uh yeah i mean her thing if i remember correctly was that we should be something to do with with uh, trying to translate word by word in order to get a better sense of the language i have no particular opinion uh, i find that a lot of these systems it's it's whatever you like to do if you get into that then go for it uh, i don't because i have a different approach so vaguely it's the same input based activities and she has a specific tack there and, and uh, for people who find that efficient and enjoyable by all means uh any tips on how to find a language partner on the internet uh yeah i mean just google language partner whatever language portuguese and english or whatever it might be huh. uh okay uh fast way to learn chinese there's no fast way to learn any particular language it's I mean, I say it over and over again. There are no shortcuts. Listening and reading and speak when you're ready. Uh, okay. Is it still time? I want to level up my journey. I mean, is it still too late? Check on the website insofar as the link 90 days. It's never the wrong time to commit yourself to intensive involvement with the language. Intensity means success. Uh, cafe. Yeah. Well, just, there's only so many things you can do. I'm currently learning Chinese. What do you recommend to start writing text by oneself and remembering characters? Uh, well, you just have, I would say today, Google, because there are systems for learning characters that didn't exist when I was learning them. What do I think is the ugliest language? There is no ugly language. Uh, how to learn English for diplomacy. If English for any special purpose is simply a matter of finding that kind of content and doing a lot of listening and reading. 
Okay, there is a uh, Google Chrome extension sub adopt that lets you download Netflix current place that you have. Okay, all right, very good. How to make kids learn because they don't really understand. Yeah, Deutsche podcast empfehlung habe ich nicht. There's no special, I have no recommendation for, and, but have a look. We have some podcasts at link, or you can just turn iTunes into Germany and then see what podcasts are popular in Germany. How do you make kids learn? Good question. I don't know, but at that, I have to get going because I have a lot of work to do. Uh, here's one now. We're going to finish off with it. We live in age where language learning has never been easy, and yet language learning in schools is in serious decline. It's in serious decline in the English speaking world. Um, but uh, I'm not sure that's true everywhere. How many times do you repeat listening to and reading the same text? As I said earlier, I don't repeat it immediately. I go forward and come back, forward and come back. But if I look at my playlist, I have listened to some items 30, 40 times. Okay, I better get out and I gotta go buy a bunch of stuff for our birthday party this evening. So thank you for listening. Bye for now.